Royal Commission Redux, bank CEOs back in the hot seat. Coming up on today's Citizens Report. Welcome to the Citizens Report for the 21st of September 2023. Joining me today is Citizens Party leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome, Craig. Thanks, Alyssa. Good to be back again. Yeah, and we have a very special report on today's show, which is why we're uh, focusing on the one topic. Uh, we have the hearings going on of the Regional Bank Closure Inquiry. So we're going to get straight into that after these announcements. Uh, which comprise of uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel. And if you're watching this on um, channel 31, which I think it's only Victoria, you can yeah. go to YouTube to watch the full show. Um, don't forget to hit the like button, make a comment, share this as widely as you can. All those things help to get the video circulating. And this one's particularly got really important content. And to make it all happen, you can uh, click on the link below to donate, especially with all the travelling that's been going on, which Craig's always complaining no, about. No, or not, not complaining, complaining, but, you yeah, know. But, uh, <laughs> Robbie does have to sit down the back of the plane, not the front. <laughs> Absolutely. But this time it's Launceston, it's Canberra, it's Juni, yeah. it's driving, it's hire cars. And look, the response of what we've been able to get what is, is completely due to you, the viewer, those who contribute people who donate. We don't get corporate sponsors. We don't get government sponsors. We don't get anything like that. It all comes from ordinary people. Mm. When I say ordinary, they're actually extraordinary people yeah. that mm -hmm. contribute and make these things happen. And without us being on the ground, I mean, we now have, we had Glenn Isherwood and we have Robert Barwick, Robbie Barwick, of course, who's on the show. Uh, these guys are both having the opportunity to meet up with councillors, yes. various members of small business communities and so forth. And the uh, the experience that we've had over 35 years is being f is feeding into this process, mm. including into the senators themselves. And we've, we've been very happy we've, we've got the video to bring to you and we can elaborate on just how powerful these these uh, you know, those these hearings are. Mm. And what I found really interesting that you know Robbie is being sought by the major radio stations. And other media, there's been more today. And even more, more today. Mm. Okay, so the, I, there's so much, it's hard to keep up with. Yeah, there is. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, that, you know, what we can uh, let our viewers know is that the uh, inquiry has been extended till March next year, mm -hmm. which is a very, very good thing because it gives us more time to organise, more time to you know bring the heat down on the bankers. And it means that the report that was due out in December is not going to get lost in the December lull, mm. which happens as soon as the last sitting of Parliament happens, which is when it was due to be released. The, uh, the Parliament goes into recess till the end of January. We have a saying around here, most of Australia goes to sleep till Australia Day. And that's about right. And then the schools come back and people get back into it. The Parliament comes back in early February. So this report is not going to go into a void. And that's a very, very important thing. Yes, we want a public postal bank. We're going to have to continue to build the momentum for that. That's coming mm -hmm. um, from from all the reports we're getting from these from these uh, yeah. these committees, the, uh, the, um, uh, these hearings. The process of the inquiry itself is what is drawing out these crucial themes that are resonating now with these handful of um, key politicians that um, you know they've got this in their um, crawl and they're pushing for um, some solution to this. And, you know, they've got the banks in their sights. So we've had, um, um, you know, to get straight into it, the um, hearings taking place in Launceston. And, of course, this is for, you know, people who don't know the full background. The Senate Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport References Committee Bank Closures in Regional Australia. So they're conducting these hearings after the complete disaster of the Regional Banking Task Force, which you know, was supposed to get at the issue of bank closures, but with uh, the bank CEOs and a Bly, the that Australian was a Banking... That was a regional bankers task force. This was nothing to yeah. do with the regional communities. That's right. So um, so this committee, uh, they had the Launceston hearing Tuesday, uh, Canberra yesterday and Juni today. And Juni is um, one of the communities that really kicked up a stink to bring the issue of bank closures to the attention of the national media. 
um, and has really gotten um, some motion with this inquiry as a whole. So hats off to them. Uh, and the senators, and I will say the reason for the headline, Royal Commission Redux, um, you know, Rob Robbie made the point when he was briefing us today uh, that the bank CEOs, because they were hauled in to the hearing in Canberra yesterday, they often get questioned by parliament where they come in and it's all fairly cursory, um, straightforward stuff. They sometimes get fairly pointed questions on various issues. But this is the first time they've really had a true grilling since the Banking Royal Commission. And it's about time because not enough, barely anything that should have been done after that Royal Commission and what it exposed was actually done. So you've had LNP Senators Matt Canavan and Jared Rennick, um, Liberal Senator Richard Colbeck, uh, Labor Senator Linda White and Pauline Hanson's One Nation Senator Malcolm Roberts holding these guys' feet to the fire in these hearings over the last three days regarding their obligations to rural and regional communities, particularly given um, all of the support, to put it mildly, that the banks have been getting over recent years. So these um, bank CEOs were squirming and sweating and getting rather cranky it sometimes got quite willing, especially with um, questioning by Senator Rennick and Senator White. Uh, and, you know, we're only going to cover a tip of the iceberg, really. We're going to show a lot of clips um, from uh, particularly the Canberra hearing, but there'll be more to come because there's actually a lot of richness of the back, with, backs of, back and forths that took place um, that we want yeah, to highlight. No, yes, sir. No, sir. Three bags full, sir. It was, we want the answers. Give us the answers. Mm. No, no, please give no. We want the answers here. Give us the answers. Mm. And they were ruthless. And yeah. it was really, I, you know, I haven't seen that in 30 years of politics, really. Mm. In, might have been a handful of cases. But this this was actually what, I mean, this is what the inquiry is designed to do, mm. get to the truth of the matter. And it's, it's out there for people to see. Yeah. And that's good. Now, we're going to start just by showing a short video uh, that Robbie filed with us from Canberra this morning. Uh, after um, you know he and Glenn had arrived in June, e, and uh, just to also mention that it came because the bank CEOs were in the stand. It did come to the attention of the national media yesterday with various excellent coverage by uh, both ABC Radio and Television. Robbie, as you said, was on Five AA in Adelaide on Burke Radio, and he's done interviews uh, today on the sidelines at June e with Win TV and Seven Prime. Um, and, you know, things like the bank's narrative about the fact that they're moving away supposedly from having branches uh, because they're following the community, those narratives are just being absolutely destroyed. So we'll just roll that clip and you can hear what Robbie's assessment was. We're at the Commonwealth Bank in the town of Juni, the bank that started the fight back the resistance against the bank's agenda of closing all their regional branches and forcing people online, regardless of the consequences. And it was the fight that was put up in June, e, with special mentions of places like Karnama and Cooperpedia as well, that led to the current Senate inquiry. And that's why we're here today, because um, this is the day three of a uh, round of three hearings this week. The first one was in Launceston on Tuesday, Yesterday there was a dramatic hearing involving the bank CEOs, the big four bank CEOs in Canberra, and now we've come to June e for a hearing so the people at June e can have their say on what the closure of the Commonwealth Bank would have done to this town. Now the good news is June e is no longer closing. They're open for at least the next three years, uh, with the caveat that they're only open three mornings a week, and the town folk are really going to fight that as well because Commonwealth Bank needs to provide better service than three mornings a week. But in yesterday's very dramatic hearings where the big four CEOs squirmed and sweated, and that's the, that's the kind of industry that goes through this town. This is a happening place, Juni. It is not a, a ghost town or anything like that that would justify a branch closure. Um, but yesterday when the big four banks sweated and squirmed on the stand because this inquiry for the first time held them account, not just with a few pointed questions, but with the message that, hang on, you owe the community from which you make your money a service. You owe it to them. 
and the, the senators pushed and pushed and pushed on that question and the, the, the big four CEOs who were used to, frankly, politicians kissing their butts. That's what they're used to and they didn't get that yesterday. They got hard pressing from senators who are very concerned on behalf of community members. And so under that kind of pressure, not only has Commonwealth Bank said it won't close branches for three more years, Matt Common, the CEO, said that Commonwealth Bank has taken this next three years to explore the strategy of taking a different approach to the other banks and being the bank that provides branches. Now I've been saying for the last year, if there was true competition in the banking system, why hasn't one of the banks broken from the herd and been the bank, the branch bank, the bank that provides face-to-face -face services? Well, Matt Common said yesterday that that is what the Commonwealth Bank is actually exploring um, with this three-year moratorium. And here's the kicker. They wouldn't be doing that if it wasn't for this inquiry. This inquiry was, was brought about by people power, getting their message to concerned citizens, senators, sorry, and the senators um, convened the inquiry and for the first time used the authority of parliament to start taking these banks on, long overdue, and it's starting to work. Now these are incremental baby steps, but it's worth highlighting because it shows you that, that um, the, the, if, if, the, if the politicians actually grow a spine and exerted the authority of parliament over these businesses, they can have an impact. The real solution, of course, is the politicians realizing, well, hang on, the authority of parliament gives them the authority to start a public bank, to really take these banks on in terms of competition, break the cartel of the big four, so they're scared to ever close branches again. That's a long-term solution, that's what we're here promoting, but the whole process is, um, uh, has been wonderful so far. This has been an excellent inquiry, and yesterday's dramatic hearing in Canberra was the icing on the cake, and we're looking forward to what the town's the good people of um, the town of Juni have to say at the hearing today. Okay, so we're now going to get into some of the clips from Canberra itself and have a bit of fun with this. Um, so we're going to start out uh, with Senator Jared Rennick uh, cross-examining the CBA CEO Matt Common on the fact that the banks have a social obligation to the people of Australia because they are guaranteed by the people of Australia and by the government and if they need it, they're bailed out immediately. It's, there's no questions asked. Uh, so we'll roll that clip. Uh, I know you talk about cross subsidisation and you can't do too much of it, um, or, you know, but to me the whole banking model is based on cross subsidisation. I mean, you, you basically, you know, a term, you know, someone will come in and deposit money with you and you'll pay them, you know, 2%, 3%, whatever, and then you will lend that out, you know, at an average margin of 2, 2.1%, 2 I think your, your margins Doing are well now. Well, get 2%. <laughs> oh, well, whatever, but, you know, you, 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 you know, you operate on a margin of 2%. So effectively, you know, the, the lender, uh, you know, who makes the deposit is cross-subsidising the, the borrower. Well, cross-subsidising you, really, because you're just the middleman that clips the ticket. Anyway, and, and this is where we come back to this whole social licence, because you're effectively backed by the Australian government. Uh, and you're talking before about your, you know, your return on equity of 14.2 per cent. That's a very good return on equity, given that you're basically guaranteed by the people of Australia. So do you accept, though, that your business model in itself is cross-subsidised as it is? By design, no. I mean, uh, our net interest margin, as you said, uh, is approximately 2 per cent. That would be down 50 per cent over yep. the last 20 years. And what's a net interest margin for a bank? It's effectively, as you said, the, the, the difference between the margin on uh, loans and uh, deposits. The calculation is actually... Uh, effectively the lending margin. And the reality is if a financial institution isn't able to generate some differential yep, between those two, yep. they can't lend. And the, the most practical, of it, perhaps the easiest way to understand uh, that through by way of an example is if we make a $500,000 home loan, we have to set aside $15,000. Uh, from, a, from a capital perspective, we have to provide yep. for expected losses and unexpected losses. Yep. Uh, and so for, for each loan, because of the amount of leverage that we have, we have a trillion dollar balance sheet. We yep. have $70 billion worth of shareholders' equity. We yep. obviously have to preserve and protect 
that shareholder okay. equity I, and I, our depositors. Okay. So I'll be more specific. I mean, basically, the Australian taxpayer landed $188 billion in a term funding facility recently throughout COVID. Yep, at very cheap rates, at between 0.1 and 0.15 per cent. Right now, you, you can now park that with the RBA at 4.1 per cent. I think it is your overnight rate. I know a lot of it's lent out on fixed loans, but you're still getting, you're still backed. Whenever you know, same with the GFC. You know, uh, former Treasurer Wayne Swan banned shorting of CBA shares uh, and other major bank shares, including Quarry. Uh, so you know that you, you're basically guaranteed with a backstop by the Australian government. So, so my point is, coming back to your cross-subsidy comment, is that if the Australian people, who effectively make up the Australian government, cross-subsidise you, don't you accept you've got an obligation to provide and cross-subsidise through essential services those banking services to the regions? So, again, let's try and separate the points. And your yep. second point, I agree with. Are we very conscious of our obligations with our customers and the broader community and yep. the history uh, and the future of Australia? Absolutely. So we, I think I, I'd, I'd offer that point versus, you know, accept it as a conclusion or derivation of the first point. Again, and this might be unhelpful levels of detail, but if you think about the term funding facility, we had $51 billion of the term funding facility. It doesn't quite work the way but, uh, that you characterise it. Effectively, yeah. all of that fixed is actually hedged into floating. One of the reasons why banks do that is to manage interest rate risk. We yeah. don't want to yeah. end up in a situation. Like treasury count. Yep. And if you think about the dollars, just maybe to help illustrate it, that $51 billion, we have $96 billion of uh, fixed rate home loans maturing this year. Yeah. So, I mean, the economics and the differential, just the calculation doesn't work. But any, regardless, like though, that. you were subsidised. The major banks were subsidised. That's the bottom line, whether you like it or not, and there was a but backstop. I, I don't, understand, it, I don't understand how it's a subsidy. The, the Reserve Bank here and many other central banks did. Because the Reserve Bank ended up making a loss that yeah. we'll have to pay no, for. That, that, yeah. that because yeah. those that bonds were, mar land out. Yeah. were yeah. marked to market yeah. against a rising interest rate environment. Yeah. There was yeah. a funding facility that was made available to stimulate growth. Yeah. But the taxpayer picks up the tab. Well, ultimately. The, the facility was given to customers, so customers derived the benefit. That's right. It's, but it's not like there was the some RBA. trading activities with that facility. We lent that money on to customers, which is why, as I said, we've got 90 At a hefty margin okay, and increased cool. volume. Well, yep. Senator Rent, we might, yep. might ask okay. you if you've so got one just, more. So, I've got two more. Well, just, very, so, so, very so I, I note that you, you're claiming that you, you've been doing the right thing by telegraphing your branch closes, right? I, again, I'd characterise it in a different way. We, we've, car we've made it very clear we're committed to staying in regional Australia until 2026. Yeah, but you can't guarantee beyond that. But regardless, you've closed branches in the past, right? And this is the thing. I mean, banks are saying, well, we're, tell you know, we're letting people know in advance that we're closing. Well, ultimately, you know, I, I can say to Matt, I'm going to break your leg. Now, whether I tell him five minutes in advance or not doesn't make the difference. At the end of the day, I'm breaking his leg. When you're pulling services out of the regions, right, banking services, and that's a pillar of, a, you know, one of the pillars of, of the regions... <laughs> It doesn't matter whether you're giving them notice or not. You're walking away from your social licence. Well, to be fair, Senator, actually, at least my reading of some of the transcripts that I've seen, I thought the thrust of some of the questioning was that, that banks should be giving more yeah. advance notice and consultation. So well, well, I, my, I think, my, I think it does make is, a difference. Is that you should stay open, period, in and, some of these regions. Well, again, on that point, the second point then, we are in, a, in agreement again because we've committed to staying open. Yeah, OK. And you know, right. do we, well, do we bear broader considerations, including our social licence obligations, who we are? Absolutely we do, every day. Yeah. Now, this, one of the other things the CBA raised, which is Robbie found rather interesting, is they explained their thinking behind the three-year moratorium that they enacted on bank closures. And they said that they're basically using that three-year period to explore the prospect of being the bank that has branches, right? So the, the branch bank, oh, you know, we're going to be the one bank that has branches um, as a way, of course, of attracting customers. But it's a, a trial period because, you know, if it doesn't work to attract customers, in other words, close down your, you know, bank account and move over to the CBA because they've still got a branch on town, which is fair enough. A lot of people will do it. But if it doesn't work, then they'll just abandon yeah. it. At least I'm not a sticky customer. They keep referring to this. You might be a sticky customer, yeah. which means you stick with the bank no matter how much 
garbage they they throw at you. And this is one of the uh, excuses that you can see Matt Coleman coming up with. Oh, it just depends on how sticky the customers are. Mm. Well, I've already moved most yeah. of my accounts to Commonwealth Bank because I'm not sticky at all. <laughs> so we'll see how, how many other sticky ones there are. Um, but look, this, and you know, obviously some people will be sceptical, etc. fine, but this was forced, they weren't intending on doing this, this was forced by the inquiry process. So as yeah. I was saying earlier, the more this inquiry continues to dig up the dirt and destroy the narratives and put the real issues on the front burner, um, the more progress we're going to make towards getting our postal yeah, bank. Can you imagine a campaign where the Commonwealth Bank says, we are supporting regional communities, we're going to have branches in regional communities, you support us and we will be there for you. And it's truthful. Yeah. If they did that, yeah. do you don't think Australian people would go to that? Of course. Of course they would. Especially would the be... community organisations and, and so and forth. This is the threat of a public postal bank, right, where you actually have a bank in every single post office. Yeah. The Commonwealth Bank knows it's going to lose customers to it. Mm. So they're, 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 starting to, they're starting to smell and sniff the, uh, the commercial problems that the mm. attitude is that they've had up until now and mm. they're starting to turn away. And so this starting, I call this sniffing the wind for the moment. <laughs> of course. <laughs> now, but one of the things that the CBA did also reveal in the course of this was that one of the reasons that for our Western Australian viewers that Bank West has not been included in this moratorium of closures is because the intention is that Bank West will go fully digital, which is really quite shocking because it is mainly intended to service the rural and regional centres. So, um, but you know, that's the way it's going. Now, I wanna move now to the NAB because um, remember NAB was the bank that admitted back in July uh, during a House Economics Committee hearing that, um, you know, they were questioned over the fact that they claim they're closing branches because there's less foot traffic coming into the branches, but they admitted in that hearing in July that they don't actually measure all the foot traffic coming into the bank. They only have records of the people who actually do transactions or bring a transaction to completion. So this was raised by Senator Linda White. And I'll just add, we'll probably do a greatest hits video with Linda White because she did a fantastic job just really nailing these guys. So she raises this question of the visitation uh, danger, um, data. And just while you're watching this clip, note the NAB executive on the right uh, with the short blonde hair and I think white dress. Uh, that's NAB executive Rachel Slade. She is the one who in July made this admission that we don't actually measure the number of people coming through the branch. So she, they obviously knew, Robbie said, I got the distinct impression that they strategized about this subject before the hearing, knowing it would come up, which for sure would be the case. So she was sitting there looking absolutely nervous and on the edge of her seat the whole time. So take note of that. Um, recently, um, well, sorry, first of all, you, you close branches, don't you? you because of the drop in foot traffic, is that, is that right? It's, it's in the drop off in customer usage of the branch network. And as Christy said, it's not just purely transactional. It, it, we do take a number of factors, but it is around the activity in a branch. Yeah, so recently was reported that, um, that when you do those statistics, um, you haven't, you've only been count, counting the transactions that are over-the-counter transactions and business bag, bag deposits. You weren't actually counting uh, general business like people coming in to sort out IT issues or provide proof of identity documents, remove names from accounts appointments for term deposit changes or to speak to staff, meeting with managers, etc. None of that was counted. Is that correct? Uh, can, can we maybe just take you through, uh, we, we look at a much broader approach than just the transaction activity. I mean, sorry, don't, sorry to interrupt you, but the, the statistics, the actual numbers that you, you talk about, the transactions, um, so you I mean, don't count, yeah, you, you only count over the counter transactions and business bag deposits, don't, don't you? Hmm? No, sorry, Senator, that's not right. So, um, so if a spokesman of yours said that that was the case, they were wrong, were they? Well, can I just tell you if they were, I don't know what somebody said to you, but that is one factor we take into consideration. 
Um, we do take into consideration what other activities going in, in, in that area, what other uh, business banking uh, partners we have in that area, agribankers. We, uh, our regional teams will examine those branches and spend time as they do every day in those branches to work out what is Talking about, well. sorry, sorry, I understand what you might do around it, but you have visitation statistics. My question is about what do the visitation statistics include? And they don't include, do they, that general business category that I've talked about? And we do look at those that as well. So the over-the-counter transactions, that's um, uh, what we include in our closure fact sheets, but it's not the only data that we look at. So we look at I'm how many... Asking about the, I'll ask about the other data later. I'm asking you specifically about the visitation data, data that you published about uh, most recently, about 59 branches. That data did not include general business transactions, did it? No. Is that right? Well, say no, but it's not the only thing we look at, Senator. Okay. When I, we I'm coming to the only other thing. So what statistics have you got... Um, about the other things, have you got statistics about the number of people who come in each branch for term deposit changes or to talk about loans? Have you got those statistics separately? Christy, you might want to take the Senator through what we do look at and where we have those stats. Yeah, no, and asking, also... Do you have statistics? Not what you look at. What, do you, what statistics do you have? Do you have raw data that says this is how many people came to you know, the, the, um, the, a particular branch asking about loans? Yes. Chris, can I hand it? Because I'm struggling with the question being asked, so I'll leave it to you to uh, take sure. that one up. Um, yes, we do have statistics. We have statistics on account openings. We have statistics on account closures. We look at number of balance inquiries, um, a range of different types of reasons a customer would come into a branch. We do have statistics for those. But why do you, so why don't you aggregate them in your visitation statistics? Because the most, um, re sorry, the thing that is most relatable that we've decided to include in our closure fact sheets are our over-the-counter transactions. But as we've said, we look at a range of statistics to inform these decisions when we're making the hard decisions to close. And also note uh, that the bank CEO, Ross McEwen, said at one point, I don't know what somebody said to you in response to Linda White saying, well, you told us in a previous hearing yeah. that you don't measure the foot traffic. So, you know, he only needs to look beside him, which he clearly would have known to see the, the person who made that comment. Um, but Linda White just kept pressing for, you know, tell us the statistics you actually keep. And they, of course, claim they keep all kinds of statistics, but they only use some of those in their fact sheets. They put out, of course, all these fact sheets where they say, oh, this is the decline of people coming in. And we'll talk about that more later in terms of the statistics they use on their fact sheets and how it's basically misleading um, because uh, Senator Rennick brought it up too. But before we get to that, let's play the clip of Rachel Slade from July um, to see exactly her words in contrast to what they just said at this hearing. I mean, how many interactions are there of a different nature? Um, and I, I imagine, you know, you probably record that, all the different kinds of things people do when they come in. Some of that will be recorded and some of it won't, but I'll pass to Rachel because Rachel has the information, it's her network, and she sees what's coming in and out every day. But yeah. maybe the, if you can um, take... it's, a, it's a great question. And those, those interactions that aren't, um, don't result in a transaction, they're, they're actually very challenging to, to measure. Um, we don't measure them. You can see why she was sidelined. Yeah, absolutely. So, so Senator Rennick then followed up uh, with this clip. Okay, so, so do you or don't you measure non-transactional um, services? We measure most of the services that Rachel spoke about. There are some that are a little bit harder to measure, but they're less frequent types of transactions. So as I said to the other senator, you know, account openings, um, inquiries that we receive, home loan appointments, other appointments, um, power of attorneys, those things we measure all of those. All right, so yeah, uh, basically their line is, oh, we measure 
most of everything, but we only use the most relatable statistics like transactions and et cetera in the fact sheet. So they're just being selective, in other words, to portray uh, some image that we've got, you know, reduced uh, people coming into branches. Let's just hear what she said again. Those interactions that aren't, um, don't result in a transaction, they're, they're actually very challenging to, to measure. Um, we don't measure them. No, you don't measure them. <laughs> um, so, you know, they, they haven't shown the evidence that they do measure them. They're just, you know, hedging, they're just covering. Now, um, Senator Rennick moved on to the question of why NAB is closing so many branches so quickly, just all right now. Why are you closing so many branches so quickly? In light of, you know, the obvious need uh, and desire by so many people in the regions to keep branches open. I mean, surely you've got an obligation uh, under the branch closure um, protocol to give greater notice to these people um, when you're closing. And, and really, under the social licence, you should remain open if you're the last branch in town. Well, we do um, work within all of the protocols that were agreed through the Regional Banking Task Force. Um, and we have been working with all of those, within all of those protocols, Senator. Um, and as we've said, where the service, the, the use of the service uh, is dropping and not being used, um, we have made that, that decision to actually close. Well, I'll dispute that because if you take Ocean Grove, for example, and you've just announced you're closing Ocean Grove, I'm looking at the volume of cash transactions uh, in the last three years. 20, from 2020, it's, it's increased from 3,864 to 4,664. Um, in terms of the number of business banking transactions, it's, it's climbed, uh, it's, it's stayed steady from 4,624 4, to 4,569. Uh, and check deposits has actually increased from 672 to 765. So, you know, we've got cases of branches here where transactions in the branches are actually increasing and you're closing down branches. Um, so there are a small number of instances where that has occurred and Ocean Grove is one of those. Um, for Ocean Grove, though, we have made significant investment across the Ballerine Peninsula, but other examples, we've done the same in right here in CBD Sydney at Pitt and Hunter Street. So um, the vast majority of branches that we've closed has been as a result of reduced foot traffic. In the instance of Ocean Grove, though, you're right that that hasn't been the case, but there has been significant investment in the area. Okay, so basically, I mean, that contradicts a lot of your prior information, though, that you said the reason why you were closing branches was because the number of transactions were decreasing, and yet we've got an example here where they are actually increasing. So yet again, I have an issue with the quality of information that you're providing to this inquiry uh, and whether you're genuinely... Uh, you know, acting in the best interests of the Australian people who underwrite your social licence. But you can take that as a comment. Well, there you got it. I mean, profitable branches increasing in turnover on their metrics. More cash. On yep. their metrics. Ocean Grove. That doesn't mean that there's not more people coming into the bank. They don't keep records like that. So the, mm. just on their own metrics, it's more cash, more, more checks even, mm. which has surprised me. Mm. And But they say, oh, well, this, 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 this is... This just happens. Yeah. I mean, how ridiculous. Yeah, no, exactly. I, we keep the statistics, you know. We know what's going on. I mean, this is just a complete um, cover job and, and smoke screen. Um, but we want to move on to Anna Bly, one of our favourite people. Uh, <laughs> and, and it was really good to see, because she's a former Labor Premier, that Linda White, for one, a Labor Senator, was not pulling any punches. She really went for the jugular. But uh, first, we'll show a clip from questioning by Senator Malcolm Roberts uh, on the advantages the banks have and why they have a certain obligation to communities. They are on a good wicket and therefore we are going to, you know, these MPs are going to hold them to account for that. Um, and Bly just straight out says, oh, I have to disagree on most of the points you've made, which is stunning that she would say that. So we'll run that. Thank you, Ms. Bly, for participating today. You mentioned um, that because of commercial decisions, this doesn't warrant 
there's not a there's not a need for consultation. It doesn't warrant consultation. Let me remind you that banks, I think banks should be commercial. So let's remove all of the big four's many legislated advantages. Let's remove the fact that they were given $180 billion from the RBA with interest payments as low interest rates as low as 0.1 per cent, and then re re relented back to the RBA at up to 4.1 per cent. They made a lot of money for minimal risk. Then, then we look at things like bank bail-in, legislated. If the bank makes a mistake, they can take money off customers and convert it to worthless shares. The past bank, uh, the props that the government has given, government guarantees for things like overseas borrowing. The four pillars itself enshrines the banks with, with less competition, the big four banks. There's a more generous treatment of the big four banks from APRA, for example, in risk weighting. The, the legislation, the, the extensively complex, complicated legislation provides barriers to entry for smaller banks. There's a, there's a complexity of legislation that provides a, a barrier against um, prosecution of the banks because it's just so damn hard to, to, to prosecute them. They dominate the cash distribution network. These are all legislated and regulated. And, and then we've got, essentially what we've got now is a low risk business for the big four banks and sticky customers who won't fly, won't fly away when they, when they shut down the branch. So we've got a guaranteed by, we've got the banks are guaranteed in security by the national community. Surely the banks owe a service to the national community. Surely the banks have a community service obligation to keep their services going. This thing, this cash, is critical for many people. The banks have admitted today they don't know, they haven't got a clue how much cash circulates between, between, uh, between their customers. So customers are telling us quite clearly that the crux of this inquiry is the need to maintain cash and the need to maintain access to banks. The banks have a community service obligation. Uh well, um, Senator, I, I would probably disagree with you on um, most of the points that you've made. I think you've drawn um, your own conclusions um, in relation to a number of these things, which, frankly, I don't think are borne out in fact. Elisa, over the last several years, or since Malcolm Roberts came into the parliament, he's been working with us studying our material on national mm -hmm. banking. And the point is that he knows this stuff now inside out because he's taken the time to really educate himself on what the old Commonwealth Bank, the People's Bank, used to be. And he's become very passionate about this yes. because what you're dealing with with Anna Bly is an apologist for the private bankers. And, and it's absolutely disgusting that a former Labor pr a Premier of Queensland is now doing the bidding of the private banks. Mm. There would be nothing more... Uh, revolting for Labor Party members to see the the entire history of what the Labor Party represented going back to King O'Malley mm. in the early 1910s, creating the Commonwealth Bank as a people's bank, being completely trashed by a former Labor Premier. Mm -hmm. But this is the problem, and, yeah. this is, and, and I could say a lot more about this. Well, but well, let's stay on the theme of national banking because I want to roll a clip now uh, where Malcolm asked Anna Bly about that question because, as we'll get to in a moment, um, the question of a people's bank had become a very, very big um, centrepiece at the previous day's Launceston hearing. So this was actually on the minds of the senators who'd engaged on the topic in Launceston in a really important way. It was right at the centre stage of their mind. So um, Malcolm asked Anna Bly where she stands on a people's bank, uh, which she had to clarify. Uh, but yeah, look at her reaction, it's stunning. We saw a dramatic improvement in accountability because the, of the people's bank that the original Commonwealth Bank was. So we saw a people's bank that grew dramatically because it offered a, a competitive and fair alternative to the um, to, the, to the private banks. We also saw enormous accountability enter the banking sector because of the Commonwealth Bank. And then we saw the private banks through both sides of politics destroy the Commonwealth Bank. And so what, we, what I'm saying now is we need a people's bank. Where do you stand on a people's bank? Well, I don't think that anyone um, has succeeded in destroying the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. It's one of the strongest banks on the planet. Destroyed it as, a, pe destroyed it as, a, destroyed it as a people's bank. bank. 
Ms. Bly, destroyed it as a people's bank. The Commonwealth Bank exists now, but it's just another retail bank. It's no longer a people's bank. What do you mean by people's bank, Senator? Owned by the people, owned by the government. Public bank. Public bank. OK. Um, well, all I know is that um, state-owned uh, financial institutions in this country have not had a great history. Um, I'm only aware of them being successful in countries like Russia and China. Uh, I, as a taxpayer, would be pretty wary about buying Australian taxpayers buying uh, back into banks or financial institutions uh, when we have a thriving banking uh, community that I says there's a bank out there for everybody. Well, what you see there, Lisa, is the, the banker's girl defending the economic rationalist policies that have destroyed this mm -hmm. country for the last 40 to 50 years. In the 1970s, you had a takeover of policy, in fact, slightly earlier than that, in the late 1960s and early 1970s, by the Mont Pelerin Society, which was a British think tank that came to Australia spurning all sorts of these think tanks that promoted the idea of small government, mm. uh, privatisation, uh, economic rationalism, and all the policies that people are complaining about now including privatising of the banks, of which the Commonwealth Bank was the first to fall. Mm. Now, this was a massive operation and, and it, was, it continued to... and it influenced politicians on both sides of the political uh, stream, not just the Liberal yes. Party, but the Labor Party as well. The economic consensus developed of both All sides. Of Everyone has to stick with the, the same policy. You had this thing of, you know, the private, banks, the private banks have to be allowed to compete against the Commonwealth Bank. You can't have a public bank because... They, uh, they, there's an unfair advantage yeah. of having a publicly owned bank with the mm. private banking system. So they destroy the Commonwealth Bank. It no longer became the People's Bank and there's been no protection against the private banking system. Mm. Now, Curtin and Chifley knew this during the war. That's why they used the Commonwealth Bank and certain regulations to control the private banks to stop them from uh, profiteering mm. from the scarcities that happened during, that happened during the war. So what, you've, what you see here, and this is again disgusting, that Anna Bloy is justifying the economic rationalist policies that destroyed this country yep. on the behalf of the private banking system. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is, you know, we've written a lot about this in terms of economic policy and how that's changed under the influence of these, uh, this policy of economic rationalism. Mm. And uh, that, it, the fact that she comes out and says it's Russia and China, and, oh, you know, yeah. that, that's absurd because, look, China is using a national banking policy look of their own done. sort. Look what they're doing. Right, look it's what the they've done. It's the most successful economy in the world, arguably. And right now, you know, Russia is part of the BRICS 11, mm -hmm. not the BRICS group of five initially, but you have the BRICS 11, mm. just with another uh, six countries joining it because what they've seen in the West is this policy of, of the bankers' dictatorship run out of the city of London, destroying destroying countries because of the conditionalities through their institutions, the World Bank mm -hmm. and the uh, IMF. Yep. And you have all these countries saying, we don't want to be part of this. Yes. And look look what happens when you oppose uh, the, the West. You end up in a war like Ukraine. And they're saying, we don't want this. There's another 40 countries that want to join the yeah. BRICS. And this is really exciting stuff, but this is the direction the world's going mm. now. Actually, the BRICS 11, uh, the BRICS conference just in South, uh, Johannesburg, South Africa, I think two weeks ago, was a turning point. Yes. There's been a paradigm shift change in the world, and Anna Bly is on the wrong side yeah. of it. Yeah, and you can read more about that backdrop with more updates and what countries like Russia, for instance, are now planning on doing at the Eastern Economic Forum, Putin just laid out a whole raft of economic development projects in conjunction with China and with India. So contact us for a copy. You can subscribe to this. Um, and that stunning backdrop, backdrop that you just alluded to is all there. Yeah, and the G G77 mm. met in Havana in Cuba. Mm -hmm. And they came out and said, you know, we, the underdeveloped nations, are sick of being told how we're going to develop. Yep. Right, a number of these nations are now looking towards the BRICS for, for membership. But that, that's not just 77 nations, it's about 139 nations that are in the same boat. Mm. So there's this growing rejection of these policies yeah. that are destroying our country, and yet mostly people are unaware of this. Yeah. Now, on that very issue of this neoliberal consensus, um, Linda White, again, took it on and challenged the very premise of it, of deregulation in particular, 
um, because in her final question, she asked all the bank CEOs to answer this. Um, she basically said, look, so with everything you're doing or claiming you're doing, you wouldn't mind if you, if we, the government, were to re-regulate you then, would you? <laughs> and funnily enough, all the bank CEOs declined to have that happen and, <laughs> and apply as well. They do not want to be regulated again, whether it be with formal regulations um, brought down in law or whether it be by a competitor such as a public and government bank, um, which is what we want to talk about a bit more now of how bringing in a government bank would be so um, crucial and would make such a difference because that was one of the big themes at Launceston, as I mentioned. Um, the topic was centre stage, particularly because um, two of the witnesses, the CEO and the chair of the Tasmanian Small Business Council raised it. They basically said, look, um, the private sector, the private banks have vacated the field. They have left, they've gone. So we have, there's no excuse for them not to be happy with government coming in and playing a role in banking again, whether it be through run through Australia Post branches, which would solve other problems because they a lot of the witnesses and they had LPO people there, licensed post office operators, etc. There was a lot of discussion about how there are branch, Australia Post branches closing, how Australia Post this, that's happening because they're inadequately compensated. They're now doing almost all the banking work in a lot of communities because the banks have left. Um, one of the witnesses raised Christine Holgate's departure and the enormous impact that had because um, she tried to have the, the adequate compensation from the banks paying the post offices and that still, that job wasn't finished. Um, and what was really good was that the senators engaged fully on this question of a government bank. They, they didn't um, throw it out the window or anything. Even Senator, the Liberal Senator Richard Colbeck was asking detailed questions about that. Uh, Senator Canavan asked how it might work and he asked these witnesses from the Business Council for details about what they thought about whether it would be successful or not. Uh, and I do want to play, this is, these are only audio clips from the Launceston hearings. I wanted to play two brief clips. The first is from um, the CEO of the Tasmanian Small Business Council, where he's talking about, um, you know, what you alluded to before with competitive neutrality, that um, the private banks or any institution should not have to compete with a government agency that has certain advantages. And he says, look, that's out the window because <laughs> the private sector's left anyway. So you know, throw that competition policy out and just let the government come in because no one else is providing the service. So we'll just roll that first clip. This is Robert Mallett. Um, how do you see that manifesting in the provision of uh, the things that you're talking about in local communities? How do we, how do we um, uh, ensure that that takes place? Sure placing conditions on um, the licence that's given to conduct banking services is a part of it. But how do, how do we ensure that um, that effectively then gets distributed around communities to deliver the service that you're talking about, and particularly in relation to uh, capacity to access cash? We, uh I suppose we've got two options. We've got an existing offer, option if uh, the Australia po Licensed uh, Post Office, for example, throughout the country, they are high quality small businesses servicing their community and have been doing for um, a long, long time. They provide a whole range of services currently. Um, they are somewhat underfunded, in my opinion, to provide the services they currently do when, even when it comes to Australia Post. I think uh, this is purely my uh, speculation. The previous CEO of Australia Post was probably on a transition to doing something well in that commercial sector. Unfortunately, she got the boot for, for providing a few watches for uh, reward for effort. That uh, was a shame. Uh, however, they may not want to do it. On the other hand, uh, I understand uh, definitely Senator Rennick uh, would prefer probably to see a government-owned bank in some of these regional areas. In fact, the, the government owned... And um, 
we, you could, it's, there might be some um, argue a, um, oh, what's the term? I had it on the top of my tongue. Uh, adver not adverse, you know, where governments and um, public instrumentalities come and overtake or take over private sector um, uh, government new Competitive neutrality is the word I'm after. One might be argued that uh, maybe the banks could argue a competitive neutrality situation if the government did set up a bank and serviced regional communities. But I would argue that given that they'd abandoned the marketplace effectively, um, that they leaves it open for government, if they wish to, to have a community bank um, issue their own or hold their own licence and provide those services in those areas. Okay, and now this next clip that I want to play is Jeff Fader. He's the chairman of the Tasmanian Small Business Council and he was also the um, uh, chairman of COSBOA, or the director of COSBOA, the um, Council of Small Business Organisations Australia-wide. So, uh, important witness. Now, it starts out with um, Senator Matt Canavan asking him a question and then he responds to it. And then going on to the Australia Post issue then, um, uh, what do you think could happen there? Do you think it should provide a full range of services then, maybe its own accounts, rather than at the moment obviously it's more a, a shop front for other banks, but do you think there could be an expansion here for the Australia Post to sort of set up its own bank, if you like, and, and compete with other banks? Um, I can see no reason why when, when the banking industry chooses to withdraw from a community why it, it should not be comfortable and the community would not be comfortable with having what is potentially a government-owned government bank delivered through uh, the local post office network. And uh, the extent to which they can uh, achieve um, and develop that would obviously have commercial issues and it would have extensive training issues but the basics are generally available and many local post offices or licensed post offices particularly um, have established <coughs> facilities and procedures. Yes, they would need to be upgraded, but because they are already in part providing cash handling and I'll call them minimal banking services, the opportunity to expand that to fill a gap which has consciously been left and provided by the existing service um, should be, in, should, should be in, in our opinion, considered seriously. Um, and I think it's important to recognise that those people who are walking away from those communities are licensed by the Australian Government to provide what one could reasonably call a universal community service. If they choose not to do that, or find it's too expensive, then they most certainly could not have any realistic complaint about uh, the government looking after its communities and its people by providing an alternative service and giving employment in those local communities. Um, yeah, so as you can see, he's also reiterating this point that the banks have just walked away from the provision of any reasonable community service. Someone has to step in. Um, so, yeah, really important focus on the Postal Bank, Craig. Yep. And today in Juni, uh, we'll put up some photos in the backdrop. We've been listening to the hearings which are being played live on um, APH, the Australian Parliament House website. Um, we don't have any um, thorough reports yet, but it, it's, it's a continuation of the same excellent questioning. There's a lot of community witnesses at this hearing because, um, you know, Juni's had... They had the stay of execution with the Commonwealth Bank agreeing to stay in town, but they're only open for like three hours, three days a week, I think it is, three mornings a week. So it's still making it very difficult. Um, as I mentioned, there has been some media coverage and we'll, we'll run a short clip, we'll put some up in the background as well. This is what a few of the comments that Robbie had to say to Win TV, and he was also interviewed by Seven Prime. The banks would have you believe that they are following the community, not forcing the community, 
that this is a new digital nirvana in which we exist, where everyone's happy, go lucky, and this is all wonderful. You go to the regions and listen to their version of events, and it is a nightmare. And they express that really well. And every region has slightly different predicates, slightly different distances between them and the next town, etc., etc. But there's a universal theme, and the universal theme is regions need cash, and banking services that provide the cash and bank the cash are essential to the survivability of the regions, and that's what the banks are taking away. So yeah, he just hit this theme, regions need cash, regions need services, which is crucial. And I'll also just add in by way of final comment, because um, Senator Linda White happened to raise this when I was listening to a bit of the hearing this morning, that Anna Bly, you know, because obviously the media is at least covering this, which is, which is great. So Anna Bly was doing the usual circuit and putting out the line. One of the things she said apparently was that branches are so 1990s. <laughs> Can you imagine? Yeah. I mean, just completely dismissing the necessity for branches because, and this has been her line all along, the future is digital, etc., etc. You know, despite the fact that we live in a country where you can often not even get mobile service between, you know, where we live and going home sometimes if you're on a Zoom call or something and you're travelling, um, let alone things like bushfires and floods and well, so on. Well, it's actually, so actually closer to home, Alyssa, because I, I just uh, discovered that the Square digital payment system, where you look at Square thing, oh, yeah. a lot of cafes use them because yeah. I think they've got very cheap fares. It went down the other day and one of our supporters had to close her shop. She lost over $2,000 mm. because people, she couldn't, she was fully digital. She wasn't taking cash. And the only way she could sell stuff was to tell people, look, you have to go home and direct deposit it into my bank account. Mm. That's the only way because she wasn't taking cash. And uh, because there was no banks in her area, to be able to do it. Hmm. And, and for her to go to the bank was a huge, huge uh, rigmarole, I'm rigmarole sure. a problem. So this is a digital payment system that went down and she had to close up in the end because she couldn't so, so she couldn't transact. Mm. Now, that, that's just one customer. Apparently there was tens of thousands of these customers oh, sure. that are now looking at a class action against uh. Square in order to recover their costs. Mm -hmm. The wonderful digital economy, even in the cities, Mm. That's what we're looking at here, and that's why cash is king. That's why we need to maintain it, mm. and people should be encouraged to use it. Yeah, and I just want to make a final appeal. If you haven't already done it, we've been talking about it on the recent shows. Um, contact your local council. We want more and more. We've got 20 or more councils that have put forward resolutions and voted up, many of them unanimously, resolutions to write to the federal members from that area demanding a postal bank. We want to get this happening all across the country. So engage in whatever way you can with your MPs, yourself, with your local council, getting other people to do the same. Let's really build up the intensity of the pre and the pressure while we're on a roll that has happened from this week's hearing. And if people want help to do it, call the number that's on the screen, the 1800 number, and we'll get back to you. We'll talk about what flyers you can get hold of. We've got yep. all the material for people to help. We can uh, send you out whatever you need yeah, and we can give you advice on what to do. We can do it over the internet or we can do it through the Australia Post. Mm. Um, whatever people need, we want to continue to build this campaign as yep. we get through to March. And, you know, you guys are responsible for having we, the fact we've got to this point. So congratulations to all involved. Thanks for tuning in. That's the show for this week. Thanks, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. See you again next week. Authorised by Robert Bowick, Citizens Party, Melbourne.